Learning outcome for three. Calculate Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms of signals using properties of Fourier transforms. In your book, Table 4.1 shows properties of the Fourier transform. This is very similar to Table 3.1, and I'd like you to have this out as you watch this video. This is based on the idea that if you have a time signal called x to t, it has a Fourier transform called x to j omega. If we have a time signal called y of t, we have a Fourier transform called y of j omega. Now let's go back and review from chapter 3. There we had the linearity property, and look at table 3.1 in your book. We said that a times x of t plus b times y of t would have Fourier series coefficients a times a sub k plus b times b sub k. And in the video for 3.7, we went through the example, taking a signal, and if we scaled it, we just scale the Fourier series coefficients identically. Property 431 in table 41 is also linearity. It works just the same way. If in the time domain we have a times x of t plus b times y of t, then our transform will be a times x of j omega plus b times y of j omega. So if we have 2x of t, we'll have 2x of j omega. Let's look at an example. If we have x of t, that's just a rectangular pulse. You'll find this in table 4.2. It's one of the common signals which you'll want to take a Fourier transform of. x of t is 1 when t is between negative 1 fourth and positive 1 fourth, and 0 otherwise. This will have a Fourier transform x of j omega. That's 2 sine of omega times 1 quarter, that's our t value, divided by pi t. If we scale that function by 2, that's going to scale our x value by 2, and then likewise scale our x of j omega by 2. Okay, go back to learning outcome 3, 7, Fourier series, time shifting property. If we have a time signal that is a time shifted version of x of t, the Fourier series coefficients would be the original Fourier series coefficients multiplied by an exponential e to the minus jk omega naught t naught. Well, remember now, our k times omega naughts are just omegas. So now, property 432 from chapter 4 is if we have a time shifted signal x of t minus t naught. Instead of a sub k, we have x of j omega. Instead of k times omega naught, we have omega. So the transform is x of j omega, e to the minus j omega t naught. This is a variable. Take whatever this form is and just multiply. Let's consider an example. If we have x of t minus 1, the Fourier transform will be x of j omega times e to the minus j omega. It is multiplied by 1, but multiplying by 1, you don't need to write that out. You do need to think it, though. Let's look at an example. Take our x of t, same one as we had a few seconds ago. If we shift it to the right by 1, the transform, this is going to be the original transform, multiplied by e to the minus j omega. Okay, in chapter 3 we had time scaling. You use this in lab. It wasn't really very visible what you were doing, but that same property exists for Fourier transforms where it's a little bit more visible. So if in our time domain we have x, where our time is scaled by alpha, so x of alpha t, the Fourier transform will be 1 over the absolute value of alpha, x j omega divided by absolute value of alpha. So if alpha is one-half, we just substitute in a one-half, substitute in a one-half, and that's going to turn this really into a two, and turn this into a two j omega. That's just algebra, nothing new. Let's consider an example, same function we were using earlier, this outcome. 
if we scale it by that divided by 2, t divided by 2, it makes it wider. Now we're going to have t, if we put in t divided by 2, we can multiply that 2 over. You see you get the 1 half. And the transform of it is going to be twice what you had here and twice what you had here. Convolution. We've been doing a lot of convolution, but in chapter 3 I did not focus too much on convolution. Looking at the output in the terms of convolution, particularly in terms of the Fourier series coefficients, it's not really clear to see in chapter 3, so I didn't focus on this. But if you look in table 3.1, you will see this property is there. With Fourier transforms, we use this all the time. This is very, very important. However, we use it in the context of a system where our input is x of t, our system is h of t, impulse response, our output y of t is x of t convolve h of t. So even though your textbook lists the property this way, we tend to use it being x of t convolve h of t produces x of j omega times h of j omega. Notice convolution in time, multiplication in frequency. Think about that. That should be really cemented in your brain. I'm not going to do an example about that here, but we're going to do it in several other learning outcomes, so you will see this over and over. But I do want to bring it to your attention now. Likewise, multiplication. We use a lot in chapter 8. If we have a signal x of t multiplied in time by a signal y of t, the Fourier transform of that product is going to be 1 over 2 pi x of j omega convolve y of j omega. This 1 over 2 pi is important. Multiplication in time is 1 over 2 pi convolution in frequency. Similar to with convolution, we tend not to use y because y is our output variable. We very often use c, sometimes p. So if we have x of t times c of t, we're going to have 1 over 2 pi x of j omega convolve c of j omega. Change those letters should not bother you. We haven't shown examples of multiplication yet, but when we draw it out in the block diagram, we have our input x of t, we draw a circle with an x indicating multiplication, and then whatever other signal is coming in, in this case c of t. And then the output of that in time is y of t is x of t times c of t. In frequency, x of t turns into x of j omega. In frequency, c of t turns into c of j omega. In frequency, y of t turns into y of j omega, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi x of j omega convolve, not convolve, c of j omega. So on every wire, we have a time signal and a frequency signal.